It's my pleasure now to um, open the Ian Webster Health for All oration. And as um, many of you know, Emeritus Professor Ian Webster usually introduces the oration at the forum, but unfortunately he's not here this year as he's retracing his family roots in the UK at present. So I'm sure, we'll, I'm sure you'll all get photos and stories about how that's going. But today our special guest is Professor Don Nutbeam, um, known very well to many of us, I'm, I'm sure. I just had a chat with Don and we, um, he was actually the Head of School of Public Health at the University of Sydney when I was doing my PhD, which I think for both of us was slightly scary because um, it does seem quite a long time ago. Um, he's had an absolutely stellar career. Um, that's included positions as Professor of Public Health at the University of Sydney, a position that he still retains, and Vice-Chancellor at the University of Southampton in the UK. He's also had senior roles in the Department of Health in the UK. He really has had a major influence um, over public health policy at the international, national and state level. He really has driven change and innovation. He's led, over the last two decades, research focused on developing and testing health literacy interventions in collaboration with colleagues in the UK and Europe and in Australia. He's an absolute international authority in health equity and health literacy. So he's going to discuss this in the context of work and thinking across his career and um, provoke us with the question, why is it that we make so little progress in addressing inequalities in health? Welcome, Don. Well, thank you very much for the, um, the introduction, uh, Rebecca. I always think on these occasions um, my mum would be very proud if she was here. Um, uh, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to elders past and present. What a great introduction and welcome to country from, uh, from Matthew. It reminded me of several things that I'll pick up during the course of my conversation with you this morning. Um, uh, I should also say that uh, I think within hours um, of um, Mark making public uh, the fact that I'd be speaking today. Ian Webster called me, um, very apologetic that he would be away um, uh, for the lecture today. Um, uh, and uh, as ever, was a great conversation to be had. I I've known Ian now for um, uh, almost 30 years, um, uh, and it's fair that I greatly admire and respect the contributions that he's made as an academic and as an activist um, in public health. Um, he's his leadership um, in public health has been an inspiration to many of us over the years who have a commitment to public health and social justice, and uh, uh, it's a great honour for me today um, to be uh, giving this oration in his name, uh, I must say. When Mark contacted me about um, giving the oration today, um, uh, I very bluntly said to him, do you think I've got anything to say that everybody hasn't heard before? Um, and I really meant it. Um, uh, I've been around a long time and I've been going on about this stuff for a long time. Um, and I wonder myself whether there's anything more to say, um, certainly from my perspective. And um, Mark caught me out a bit. Um, I don't know whether this was off the cuff or a plan he had, but um, he said, what I'd like you to do is to tell us a bit about your life story. Um, give us some context to help us to understand a bit more about how, uh, who you are um, and what's influenced you um, uh, and tell the story that you've told many times before from a more personal perspective. And um, without thinking, I said, oh, yeah, oh, I'll find that sounds all right. I'll have a think about that. And I tell you really honestly, I found this incredibly stressful. Um, uh, I'm not one for either introspection um, uh, or retrospection. Uh, I never look back, actually, um, because I don't want to see who's chasing. Um, uh, and, you know, I've, I'm also quite private. I don't sort of often talk about my life. Um, I just get on with what's, uh, what's in front of me. And I genuinely agonise about this, so much so that um, uh, I actually had about four or five slides with photos from my childhood and my family history. Um, and I deleted them all at about 9 o'clock last night um, uh, because I had a sort of wobbly about it. Um, uh, did I really want to do all of this? But uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I've uh, pulled myself together. Um, uh, and I thought I would at least give you a little bit about um, my background, um, only in the sense um, that um, 
with a bit of retrofitting, it, it helps explain where I was coming from in terms of what's influenced me and uh, why I did some of the strange things uh, that I've done um, during my career. Um, I, I'd have to say there's nothing terribly exceptional about my life and family circumstances. There are people here, I am certain, um, uh, who've come from uh, much tougher family backgrounds and achieved much more. Um, but uh, my only excuse is Mark asked me. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a bit. I'll tell you a couple of family stories um, that might give some context. Um, it starts with World War II, which is really going to age me. Um, but I'm the youngest of five um, uh, in my family. And as my mother would regularly say to me, I was a delightful late surprise um, as an addition to the family in the sense that all four of my brothers and sisters were born uh, just before or during um, the Second World War. My family um, lived in Portsmouth um, in the south coast of England. Some of you may know of Portsmouth. It's not necessarily a place you'd visit. It, it's the home, traditional home, of the British Navy. Uh, my father uh, was um, uh, a dock worker in the naval dockyards, um, and my mother, uh, when uh, she was working, which wasn't much when she was uh, having a family, um, actually helped to run a, a small family shop in Portsmouth. But the Second World War absolutely changed everything for my, uh, my family. Um, the, the, their, their home was destroyed um, in a bombing raid. Fortunately, the family were in a shelter at the time uh, that the bombs hit. Uh, the family were subsequently distributed um, among other family members um, in the immediate aftermath uh, of the destruction of their home. Um, and uh, my mother and uh, youngest sister, who was at the time, I think, just one year old, uh, were then caught in a second bombing raid um, and were buried um, in the rubble of the house. And uh, my mum told a very dramatic story of um, how she managed to get my sister through a small gap in the rubble so that she would be rescued, but didn't honestly know whether it would be possible for her to be rescued. Now, I, I tell you all of that because... Um, my family, uh, my mother was successfully rescued, um, uh, largely uninjured, um, but the family at that point were evacuated out of Portsmouth along with many other families with young children. My father stayed behind to work in the docks and we went, that family went to a small country town called Newbury in Berkshire. Um, I learned many, many years after um, uh, this um, that, that they lived in it effectively in a sort of refugee camp. I couldn't describe it in any other way, in a, in a tent um, for almost a year before accommodation could be found for them. And they eventually um, found a home in one of those classic, awful 1920s British terraced homes uh, public on a, on a very neglected public housing estate, um, uh, which is where I was born um, some years uh, after the war. Um, our family home uh, was one of these classic two-up, two-down homes, uh, which um, had to accommodate uh, at different times six or seven of us. Um, it had uh, no heating. Um, it had no hot water. Um, had an outdoor toilet. Um, and that's where I grew up, um, uh, uh, in this quite difficult public housing uh, estate um, in uh, Newbury in Berkshire. Um, uh, and I was reflecting on the fact that um, I don't recall ever knowing a single adult that didn't smoke. Um, I don't... Uh, I recall relatively high levels of unemployment. Um, I recall a lot of people were sick. Um, uh, and I treated it all as natural. That was how life was. Um, I do recall at times being hungry. I certainly recall at times um, uh, being cold. Um, my father, uh, who was a heavy smoker, um, uh, became very seriously ill when I was quite young um, and had to stop working. He had uh, chronic emphysema and uh, uh, bronchitis. Um, and stopped working when I was, I think, about four years old. And uh, my mother 
uh, had to go out to work, um, often uh, uh, two, sometimes three jobs to um, make ends meet. Um, I tell you all of that, again, not saying wasn't that tough. Um, I'll be really honest, I absolutely enjoyed my childhood. Um, loved every minute of it, and, uh, and um, everything I've described was just normal. Um, didn't, uh, it didn't mean anything to me um, that we lived in those conditions and that my family were poor and we didn't always have food and we certainly didn't have heat um, uh, and that the house was damp. Um, so, so that's the kind of background I came from. Um, but it turned out I was quite bright at school. Um, uh, and um, uh, I, I got the offer of a place at a grammar school. Um, we would call them selective high schools um, uh, in uh, Australia. Uh, and I was the first and only person on my estate ever, ever, um, to get offered a place at the local grammar school. Um, uh, and I have to say, um, I prevaricated because I didn't want to stick out particularly about whether, you know, my, uh, whether, whether to go, but my mother insisted. Um, uh, and um, I came into contact with an entirely different world, um, with different set of values, um, with different uh, sense of ambition, um, and it's fair to say that um, education was transformational um, uh, from my perspective. Um, I have to say, um, I, I will say I was teased a lot um, back on the estate um, because I wore a different school uniform from everybody else. Um, these days we probably call it bullying. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I did suffer both physical and mental torture um, for a period of time when I started at this school, but it was all good fun, and um, I, I have to say I don't think I feel too scarred as a consequence of all of that. Eventually, because of my father's deteriorating health condition, we were rehoused um, when I was, I think, about 13 years old. We finally got into another terraced house, uh, but one that was built much more um, recently and that had decent insulation and some heating um, and provided a quite different environment for my now very sick father. Sadly, he died within a year um, of us uh, moving into uh, to that property. And again, uh, my mother had to work incredibly hard to, uh, to keep things going. So, so I, I'm sorry to bore you with all this, but it, it, I'll get there eventually onto my second slide, which will uh, take you into, uh, take you into the, the context for all this. But my, my only excuse is Mark asked me to say. <laughs> Um, the, 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 I suppose where I'm getting to in all of this is that, 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 of course, we are so fundamentally shaped by the social and economic circumstances that we grow up in and that we learn about in uh, our lives. And these have been um, important markers for me um, uh, th throughout my life. Um, now, uh, uh, although my father died and we were uh, struggling mightily and my four siblings, all of whom left um, school at age 14 or 15 uh, with no qualifications what's, uh, at all, um, I was under some pressure to leave school um, uh, at that time and uh, my mother absolutely insisted that I should stay on. And uh, again, I was uh, quite successful at school and uh, not only um, completed year 10 but also stayed on to complete the equivalent of year 12, um, did my A-levels as we call them. Um, uh, in the UK and actually did quite well. Um, uh, there was no thought that, that, that I should go to university. And I can say to you very honestly, other than the teachers who taught me at the grammar school, I had never met a person who had gone to university. And I, I can be also honest, I had no idea what a university was. Genuinely, no idea at all what a university was. Uh, and I rather brilliantly got a job in a bank. Um, and honestly, my family were incredibly proud of me. I'd, uh, I'd uh, gone through my high school education to a point of completion and had got a good job um, in a bank. Um, and today's lecture could end at that point, um, uh, were it not for the fact that uh, three or four months into working in a bank, I ran into 
uh, the headmaster of my school, um, uh, who in a very British way said, not me. Why didn't you go to university? Um, uh, and I was terrified of him, actually. Uh, uh, and um, I said, honestly, I, I never thought of it. Um, really, I had never honestly contemplated the idea of going to university. Um, I didn't know what it was. Uh, anyway, to cut a long story short, to his great credit, um, he talked me through um, how to apply for university, helped me complete the forms, took me to a couple of universities, because we had no car, of course. Um, and to cut a long story short, after a lot of persuasion, um, I was persuaded to go to a teacher training college because it was the only thing that I could relate to that you could do at a university, honestly. Um, uh, very difficult to understand, I know, these days, but then it was I couldn't relate to doing anything else. So, um, so I joined a, a teacher training college that was part of the University of uh, Southampton. Now, I'm going to sort of end it all at that point. Um, there, there is another journey of how do you get from training as a teacher to being a, uh, a public health specialist, but it's too long and too boring to go through. But I, I stuck with the University of Southampton. I eventually did a master's degree in health education, a PhD in what we would these days call behavioral epidemiology, all at the University of, uh, of, uh, of Southampton. Which leads me on to my talk. <laughs> so what am I going to do? I'll tell you a bit about me because Mark asked me to. Um, I want to introduce you to two important people who utterly um, transformed the way um, uh, my career shaped up. I want to talk about three important projects in my career that I think have shaped all um, uh, of my thinking um, about public health. Uh, and then, if time allows, um, a bit of uh, at the end about my current obsession with health literacy. Um, what I wanted to say, though, um, was that um, that long and boring story I gave about, uh, about myself, uh, which again I will repeat, is unexceptional and I genuinely know that uh, there are many others who've been through uh, much tougher lives than that and have done much more. Um, it, 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 it meant that intuitively uh, I've always understood, I think, that social, economic and environmental conditions shape our lives and our life chances. It's just, it's intuitive if you grow up in that kind of environment. You can't avoid it. It sits with you uh, every day um, uh, if you've lived that life. I also, though, felt very strongly, uh, as I mentioned, I, I don't believe I knew an adult that didn't smoke. Um, uh, I watched my father die um, as a consequence of his smoking, and I subsequently watched my brother um, who was a 30-a-day roll-your-own and no-filter guy, um, die of lung cancer in his 40s. Um, so I, I didn't need any persuading that there's something about individual behavior, personal choice, um, that uh, really matter, really matters. But I also understood the connection um, between the way people live their lives and the social and economic circumstances in which they lived. It's also uh, a theme you'll find throughout um, uh, my uh, story uh, that role models are really important. Um, uh, I mentioned to you the head teacher and some of the teachers at the school uh, that I went to. Uh, uh, they were really important in pushing me on at times when it would have been a lot easier to stop, to bail out. Um, uh, so especially when my father died, uh, I was under some family pressure to um, to bail out of school, but uh, I got very positive support at that time from the school and, uh, as I said, particularly support and encouragement from my mother. Uh, at the end of it all, though, for me, um, education is utterly transformative. Um, uh, and this is something that's stuck with me throughout my entire career, that if we want to change things, one of the most important things that we can do is engage with people, uh, whether that's through formal education, and we, I think, all know and understand how transformative formal education can be, or through health education. Um, the most transformative and sustainable changes in people's lives and health, in my experience, have come because people have engaged with their health 
on the basis of an understanding, a better understanding um, uh, about their health. So moving on, um, uh, I've just been away for two weeks to celebrate my 40th wedding anniversary. I've been on an island in Tahiti, near Tahiti um, uh, avoiding emails for two weeks, which has been absolutely wonderful until I got back into the office on Monday. Um, but I also realised um, I'm celebrating the 40th anniversary of my career in public health. Um, uh, this year I started uh, my career um, uh, following completion of my undergraduate degree and honours year. Um, in 1978 I joined the NHS as a health education officer um, by a beautiful symmetry back in Portsmouth in the local health district um, in Port Portsmouth. And whilst I enjoyed being employed and I enjoyed doing something that I was interested in um, uh, and felt was worthwhile, um, I have to say I quickly became uh, rather frustrated. Uh, the late 70s and early 80s, there are very few in this audience um, who can relate to this, um, were a very interesting time to come into a public health career. Um, uh, in particular in the UK, um, it was a period of transition from uh, a Labour government to an ultra-conservative government led by Margaret Thatcher. Um, and uh, at that time, um, uh, all of the focus in health education was on what people should be doing for themselves. It was a very individual behavioural orientation uh, to what public health was all about. Uh, and I've had fun trawling through the internet to try and find some images that might illustrate this. But um, the three I've chosen each have a purpose. The first is the, um, the, the little thing there, um, uh, which was a typical of an advert um, being run by the National Health Education Council in the UK, um, uh, around a general theme called look after yourself. It's a very clear message, because we're not going to look after you. Um, uh, really, it was that blunt in a way, look after yourself. I mean, we'll give you a few tips and hints, but you're on your own. Uh, message number one. Message number two um, was this extraordinary um, uh, anti-drugs campaign that was run by the government during the 1980s, um, uh, which uh, consisted basically of a whole load of scary posters. Um, and it turned out um, the government records are have to be released after 25 years in the UK unless there's some reason not to. turns out um, what many of us suspected at the time, that these adverts were not targeted at heroin addicts. Um, they were targeted at the middle class parents who were worried about heroin addicts. Uh, and they were entirely intended to reassure the voting public that the government was doing something about heroin addiction when actually it was doing bugger all. Um, uh, and it was not untypical of the time that um, uh, public health was about reassuring the public w we were doing something about public health, not actually doing something about it. And the last one, who knows who the lady is? Hands up. Yeah, who is it? Nancy Reagan, yes, President Reagan's wife. Uh, and the Reagans uh, uh, actually properly are credited with the Just Say No campaign. So how do you solve, um, how do you wage war on drugs? You tell people just to say no. I have to tell you, things haven't moved on a long way in the US. Um, uh, and we can all observe how successful this strategy has been. Um, so the reason I chose those is that they're very good examples of how things work. Now, this could never happen in Australia. I feel confident that you would never get a government um, telling people how to behave. You'd never get governments doing public relations campaigns to mainly to reassure the public that they were doing something when they weren't. Um, and I'm quite sure we would never wage war on drugs in Australia. Um, but the point I would make at the end of all of this, I was getting frustrated because these didn't relate to my understanding of health and what causes health and ill health, what promotes health and causes ill health um, in populations. So I started being a bit argumentative 
um, uh, in my service in a nice, polite British way. Um, uh, and I, I, I asked if I could um, uh, start up a project. I had this project in mind, uh, which was to tackle smoking in hospitals. Now, it would be shocking for you to hear um, that there were absolutely no restrictions on smoking in hospitals anywhere in the UK. Um, uh, patients, visitors, staff uh, could smoke anywhere. Um, uh, and there was a vague advisory from the Department of Health that you should um, do something to limit smoking in hospitals, but absolutely nothing was done. And so I decided that one practical thing that I could do is work with the local hospitals in the health district to see if we could environmentally reduce exposure to tobacco smoke and restrict smoking and encourage and support staff to quit uh, uh, smoking. Smoking among nurses at that at that time was around 68% from memory. Um, it was really common. And most nurses started smoking during their nurse training. Um, and that doesn't happen anymore, of course. Um, the, 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 the point I would make is that there, we were a long way away from providing any kind of leadership in the NHS on these issues. Now, my boss rejected the proposal out of hand, uh, but I'm pleased to say that her boss thought it was a good idea. And um, so I did some work on this. Um, uh, and uh, it, it, long, cut a long story short, it was quite successful, um, so much so uh, that I was asked to write about it in this journal article up here called A Breath of Fresh Air um, uh, in something called the Health and Social Service Journal, which was the most widely read professional journal in the UK at that time. And uh, as a consequence, I caught the attention um, of a guy called John Catford. Some of you may know or have heard of John Catford, um, who was a rising star in our regional health services. Um, and again, cut a long story short, um, I got seconded to work with John, and we did a region-wide study of smoking in hospitals as a baseline against which we would try to promote wider change through uh, the entire local health system in the, in the central south of England. And um, it was the first piece of research I ever did that got published. It was published in The Lancet um, in 1983. It's going to show how really old I am. Um, uh, and led to what, for me, was a decade-long uh, working relationship and close partnership with John Catford, um, who uh, as, uh, was then and um, I would say still today remains something of a mentor uh, uh, for me. Um, John went on to do uh, great things. Um, John, though, in turn, uh, came to the attention of the World Health Organization, who uh, at that time, under the leadership of the second person there, Elona Kickbush, uh, was starting to uh, rethink what public health might be about. Um, and how we go about changing and improving the health of populations um, nationally, locally, and uh, internationally. Um, uh, and through John, um, I came to know uh, Elona and became quite involved um, uh, in some of this thinking. Um, we, um, John Catford and I, um, started Again, with the loner's influence um, uh, and to some extent guidance, uh, started thinking very hard about what this new approach might actually be. Um, and uh, although well established now, the language of health promotion was not well established in the early 1980s, I have to tell you. And um, there's a publication there um, that John and I put together back in 1984 where we tried to articulate our understanding of the difference between health education and uh, health promotion. You have to get the historical context here. Uh, this was 1984. And um, we were quite excited about, uh, about these ideas. Um, it is an, is an interesting historical read. Um, uh, but uh, basically, um, we were a bit aggressive about the utility of health education, especially given the context that I uh, just described to you, 
uh, and wanted to see a much broader base of interventions um, to improve public health that might include, for example, environmental and organizational change, specific economic and regulatory activity, much more active um, community engagement and community development, um, but also a much stronger focus within the NHS on the development of preventive health services. Um, Ho-hum, you all say, um, but nonetheless, I have to say that in 1984, this was pretty radical stuff, uh, and it was particularly radical in Thatcher's Britain, um, uh, I, I can tell you. Um, John and I, um, uh, John in particular, but, uh, but John and I both uh, became very involved in the organisation and planning of um, what was to be the first WHO international conference on health promotion that was held in Ottawa in, uh, um, in Canada in 1986. And the, uh, the outcome of that conference uh, was the so-called Ottawa Charter. As you, I'm sure, would be aware, an enormous amount of work goes into uh, the pre-planning for these sorts of conferences. So the Ottawa Charter was the product of probably two years of work prior to the conference itself. But uh, I know that for some of you will be, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with the Ottawa Charter, but this was a, a really um, important, um, uh, I called it my major project number one. I will move through the other two a bit more quickly, I assure you. Um, but major project number one that for me was transformative um, uh, in my career and allowed me to connect my personal history uh, with what I thought public health was and should be about. Um, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with some of the uh, really important principles that sit within the Ottawa Charter. Um, first of all, I think it was a reiteration of WHO's uh, understanding of uh, a holistic and functional concept of health. Um, it, it, it really emphasised, I think, more strongly than anything WHO had done before it, um, how we have to tackle all the determinants of health. Um, uh, and that requires us to operate across different sectors. Um, it requires multiple actions um, uh, if we want to tackle the different determinants of health. Health promotion itself is a process. It's a way of changing things. It's intended to be enabling. Uh, so it's done uh, by, with, and for people, not on them and to them. Um, uh, it's um, largely about trying to determine how we help people improve control over the determinants of health. And uh, I've always found the phrase um, making healthy choices, easy choices, one of the nicest ways um, of summarizing what the charter was all about. It was how you made it easier for people to be healthier uh, by addressing the full range of determinants uh, of health. So this was transformative uh, for me. Um, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I would say that one of the effects of the Ottawa Charter and uh, a wave of enthusiasm for different forms of health intervention that flowed from that was uh, an, an unintended um, diminution in the importance of health education. Um, uh, it actually was quite unpleasant at times um, in the sense that there were a number of established national and international organizations uh, that, that were for health education who were uncomfortable with this slightly messier, more politicized um, uh, um, approach to improving health in, uh, in population. And, and there was, a, a, frankly, a bit of a culture war uh, that operated during uh, the 1980s. Uh, uh, and I have to say that you know, at times, health education as an idea was um, portrayed as contributing to a victim-blaming culture in public health. It was definitely unfashionable uh, and very much the poor relation to this ultra-cool new thing that we called health promotion. Um, my sense at the time, and it remains today, is that um, uh, it, it, it can lead to an uncomfortable drift towards wanting to do p things to people rather than for and with them. 
Uh, and I think if you want a, a con if you want a, a, a recognisable example of that, I think we've made that mistake too often in trying to improve indigenous health in Australia, where we've tried to do things to people uh, rather than for and with them. Um, and, and there is this sense, if you if you position it in this way, uh, you'll understand, I hope, what I'm saying, that y you need both. It's not an either-or thing. It's not the health education's uncool and health promotion's cool. Um, uh, we actually need all of it. So a little sidebar, um, because I just want to keep telling you about my... I love talking about myself, to tell you about my life. Um, but a little sidebar was that the second international conference on health promotion was actually held in Australia, in Adelaide, in 1988. I was invited here. Um, I was invited primarily to speak about work that I was doing at the time with John Catford on the Heartbeat Wales program, uh, which was a terrific, again, terrific um, formative experience uh, for me in running a large-scale community-based intervention to tackle heart disease in a population and the first genuine opportunity I ever had to work as a part of a team trying to deliver a comprehensive and integrated intervention that addressed social and economic determinants as well as uh, the uh, behavioural determinants of, uh, of health. A great program, don't have time to talk about it today, but I was invited to come and speak about this program. Um, a um, couple of things happened there. I met Steve Leader um, uh, at the conference and I heard about Australia's Better Health Commission. You can look it up. Most of you are too young to remember it, I'm sure. Um, uh, I also, um, I'm never quite sure how this happened. I got to visit the University of Sydney, uh, which I thought was amazing. Uh, and I got to visit the School of Public Health, which I thought was um, amazing, but for all the wrong reasons. Um, uh, gee, it was, it was, oh, dear, oh dear, needed a bomb under it. Um, I also, incidentally, um, uh, uh, because of the work on Heartbeat Wales, got invited by uh, Deirdre Degeling and some colleagues um, in Western Sydney to go out west um, and visit the Healthy Hearts West program, which was um, uh, absolutely fascinating uh, to me. Um, one of the people I met uh, was Elizabeth... Co who's the secretary? Koff. Elizabeth Koff, who happened to be a project worker working on Healthy Hearts West at the time. Bet you didn't know that. Not a lot of people know that. She's a great supporter, by the way, of health promotion and public health. She's just a closet supporter. That's it. She needs to be brought out. Anyway, the, the long story of the sidebar um, uh, is that uh, within 18 months, Steve Leader had, uh, uh, had done a job, um, both on the university and on me, and, uh, and actually I was appointed as a chair in public health um, early in 1990 and came out later in the year. Um, once I'd sorted out my visa. Project number two, I got to work with a dream team. Um, I had great difficulty, I was telling Mark, I had great difficulty in finding a photo of Liz. Um, uh, and I eventually got one off his Twitter feed. Um, uh, but uh, I, I uh, uh, once I'd got my feet under the table and had got to meet people and told them what our, my mission in life was, which was to transform public health in Australia, um, I, honestly, I was like that in those days. Um, uh, still am a bit. Um, but long, long story short, um, after the Better Health Commission, the, the, uh, the Labour government at the time, uh, uh, health, the super health ministry headed up by Brian Howe, wanted to undertake a review and revision of Australia's national health goals and targets. And um, I won the contract, led a team, uh, to, um, to undertake. This was an 18 months project, a lot of consultation involved. Um, uh, and I got to work with this tremendous group of, uh, of people who led the project. Uh, Marilyn actually did most of the work, to be really honest. But um, the rest of us provided a lot of advice and support along the way. Um, uh, and I had the privilege of working with this terrific group of people um, now 25 years ago. Um, and at the end of all of that, uh, we, we produced this report that I would still argue uh, remains pretty much a blueprint for how you improve health in a population. 
Um, the, the reason I really want to sort of focus on it as a major project that, uh, that, that, um, that, that gets us back to where we need to be, in my view, is that we had a very simple matrix um, in the report. The report was divided into four chapters um, uh, that dealt with these four issues. Um, and the arrows are really important, and the positioning of things is really important in this diagram. We understood, we believe, that if you want to transform health uh, and improve equity in populations, you have two basic routes. One is to improve health literacy in populations, and the other is to create healthy environments. And we're back to making healthy choices, easy choices for people. And these two things, improving health literacy and transforming environments, are both interlinked uh, and in turn determine how people lead their lives and how we reduce um, avoidable mortality and morbidity. And I'm going to say this remains to this day my view of how we should organise things. And we wrote this brilliant report. Um, the other thing I wanted to draw attention to um, is that 25 years ago, uh, we were advocating for a national strategy to improve health literacy in Australia. Um, now, one of the things about doing these sorts of jobs for governments is that things change. Uh, we published this report to great uh, uh, acclaim uh, in uh, early 1993, uh, and I think probably within two months, um, Keating called an election. Um, uh, they, the government were returned, but Brian Howe moved to a different portfolio. We had this delightful chap called Graham Richardson, um, who became health minister, and he didn't want any of this. Um, and so these ideas, including the proposal for a national strategy on health literacy, um, including this analysis of how you go about transforming health and improving equity, were basically binned. Um, and that's sort of what happens sometimes um, uh, in life. Um, but it, it was project number two that really shaped the way I think about things. And just to go back, this has remained for me the simplest way in which I can explain what I think public health is all about. Um, and it positions health literacy in a very important place because if we bring people with us, if people are engaged in what we're trying to do, that they're both more likely to be they're in a better position to make good choices about their own health and the health of their families, and they're also in a better position to understand and want to support changes to public policy, uh, which in turn can create uh, a, different, a, a change in, uh, in healthy environments. We know that by bringing about change in some of the social determinants of health, we can both make it easier for people to lead healthy lives, and we can have a direct impact on um, health outcomes. Very simple explanation of what I think we should be doing. And if you took nothing away from the lecture today, other than that, I'd encourage you to take that one away with you. So things change again. Uh, another little sidebar. Um, I was head of School of Public Health, and you have to be careful about what happens to you when you become a head of School of Public Health, because I, frankly, was having a ball um, uh, as head of School of Public Health and had a phone call. To say it was unexpected doesn't really capture it. And I, I was approached about whether I'd be interested in returning to the UK to become the head of public health for the government in the UK. Uh, and I said a bit like I said to Mark, don't be ridiculous, I can't do that. Um, uh, uh, I, uh, and as it turned out, the timing wasn't right. My daughter was going into year 11. It would have, uh, it would have been a, too much of an upheaval for her, and I told them to go away and uh, find someone else. And they did try to do that, but failed. Um, so a year later, um, just as my daughter was uh, uh, going into the final stages of her HSC, they came back again. Um, and said, are you sure we can't interest you in coming to the UK to be the head of public health for the new Blair government? Um, and uh, on this occasion, I said yes. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the explanation for this, by the way, was that the Blair government um, came into power after 19 years 
of continuous conservative government in the UK uh, and recognised um, that there were a whole generation of public servants who'd never worked for anything other than a conservative government. And their solution to that was to bring people um, uh, from entirely outside of the civil service system in to parachute them into some quite senior roles in order to bring new thinking. And um, uh, for whatever reason, I'd been chosen um, to perform that role in public health um, in the UK. And it was an extraordinary um, opportunity and an extraordinary phase um, in my career. It led to uh, the third of my three major projects that I think have helped shape my thinking about what do we do about improving health and equity. Um, and I don't have time to go through this, and some of you will have heard me speak about this before, but for almost three years, I led a program um, uh, across government um, uh, to tackle health inequalities in a meaningful way um, for what I think was probably the first time ever um, uh, in the UK. And um, to try and summarise the work that went into this in a couple of slides doesn't do it justice, but I'll, I'll, I'll quickly tell you. There were three basic strategies that we adopted. Um, first of all, um, that uh, we, we wanted to get much more focus within government as a whole and particularly in the Department of Health onto prevention um, and a much more sophisticated understanding of what the types of actions that you needed to take. I hope you can see the transfer of the work that we did in Australia directly into the UK here um, to actually address uh, the underlying determinants, the drivers of um, inequity in health. Secondly, um, our view was that it shouldn't be a project tacked on on the fringe of all the things that go on elsewhere. It should be absolutely part of the mainstream business, first and foremost of the NHS, but also of other departments uh, of government. Secondly, we recognise that some challenges were so deeply entrenched and so complex that they require targeted interventions. So it's not to say you can just do everything by getting adjustments within the mainstream. You have to have some targeted um, uh, interventions. And finally, um, we recognised that the only way to sustain things was to get them embedded um, in local communities. So these were the four underlying pillars um, of the strategy that was developed for the UK at that time. And then uh, four key priority um, uh, themes. Um, firstly, um, uh, a, a primary focus on supporting um, families and children. I'm sure these slides will be available, by the way, if people want to look at this afterwards, but the report itself is still available on the National Archive um, on that uh, web address. Um, secondly, um, working uh, with local communities. Thirdly, tackling poverty, low basic skills, um, uh, employment uh, and low incomes. And finally, ensuring that the NHS itself uh, provided um, leadership um, and uh, an example. These things um, uh, are, you'd only understand if you've ever been a public servant. This was a triumph if you're a public servant. Um, firstly, because we got the Prime Minister to write the forward um, to the document. And secondly, it wasn't a Department of Health document. It was a whole of government and the only whole of government document produced um, uh, in that period um, of government. It had every department of government signed up and every department of government had made commitments uh, to tackle unemployment, reduce poverty, improve housing, uh, increase educational opportunity and participation, um, uh, every, every part, uh, improve uh, transport options, making cycling. I mean, every part of government had made a financial commitment to uh, this strategy. Uh, and as I cheekily note at the bottom, um, the idea of health in all policies um, uh, was not a new one. Um, uh, it was something that I think we'd been able to put into practice. Um, my work was done, and I left the Department of Health, I think, within a year 
of this um, uh, program being put in place. Uh, somewhere in the region of £2.5 billion pounds was committed across different government departments to um, the changes that were set out in this document. And um, as often happens, um, they were mostly implemented um, over the subsequent years of the, uh, of the Blair government and um, uh, then mostly undone by the global financial crisis and the subsequent Conservative government uh, that, were, uh, that, that, that uh, came to power after that and will probably be further undone uh, by Brexit. Um, but it was a good effort, I thought, um, uh, and for me, um, uh, at least exemplifies what I think we need to do if we're serious about tackling um, equity in health. So what do I think I learned um, from those key projects? And, and I'll sort of start to wrap up uh, now, just to reassure you, Mark. I'm not sure how we're doing for time. When do you need me to finish? <laughs> oh, OK, well, I'll, I'll rattle on then. <laughs> So, so, so some of the things that I think um, I, I'd want to observe, as if you didn't know, um, uh, if we're serious about tackling health equity, uh, inequity, um, is bloody hard. Uh, and it's hard because it's complicated. And it requires sustained effort. And, and I think what you have, you'll have seen from my major projects, it's the sustaining that's really hard. Actually, it's possible to engage governments at a level and in a way that's quite meaningful. I think we did it in the early 90s in Australia with, uh, with Brian Howe as health minister. Uh, certainly we did it um, uh, during, the 19, uh, during the 2000s um, uh, in the UK, um, uh, during the, the Blair era, where the government was actually seriously committed to try and doing something about it. But it is really tough to sustain it across sectors. Hard enough to get the health system to be responsive to these challenges, but to sustain efforts across different sectors is really very hard work. Uh, I, I think I would observe, honestly, um, that health promotion as conceived of um, uh, uh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, um, is for me the most complete way of responding to this challenge, uh, what is an entrenched and very complex problem of inequity. However, um, uh, I've observed across my, across my career some dangers in focusing only on the social determinants of health, the risk that we start to do things to people um, rather than with them. Um, and I, I have felt for 25 years now uh, that the concept of improving health literacy in populations has to sit alongside our efforts as public health activists and advocates to ch change the social determinants of health. One without the other simply won't work. It's not sustainable in all of my observations. And as I say at the end, bringing the two together provides um, a powerful platform uh, for change. I want to finish up. Uh, with my current obsession with health literacy, as if I hadn't explained it a bit there. Um, so, so one of the things I want to pass on, particularly those of you at an earlier stage in your career, is you sometimes have to be patient. Um, so as I've made very clear, um, we presented, I think, some quite sophisticated ideas about improving health literacy in the Australian population 25 years ago. Um, uh, about 20 years ago, I wrote a paper on health literacy. It was eventually published um, in the Health, uh, the health, um, health Promotion International. I'm not sure if Evelyn would actually publish it today, but certainly I got through the, um, the editorial process uh, after a bit of an effort um, uh, in the late 90s. A uh, paper published in 2000. Um, on health literacy as a public health challenge for the 21st century. Very grand, um, understated title type of thing I'm inclined to do. Um, and I'm pleased to say it was completely ignored. Um, I didn't think I had any reception from that paper for years. 
Um, uh, uh, and I thought, well, fair enough, you know, I'm clearly ahead of my time again. And, uh, um, uh, and uh, 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 anyway, I, I, all of a sudden, for reasons I honestly can't explain, around about 2007, 2008, um, I started seeing the paper cited. People were using it. Uh, and I, I've got no explanation for this, except you have to be bloody patient sometimes. Um, uh, but it started being cited. And it, as it turns out, it's now, by a very long stretch, the most cited paper I've ever written. Um, but all I can say is, I've been saying this for years. Because um, uh, there was nothing in that paper, really, that, I, that, that didn't have its origins back in the work that we did in the very early 1990s on the national health goals and uh, targets. And there's stuff in there that I think you, 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 you all know, and you won't be surprised, to, given what I've explained, to hear me say that I, I felt it was, it's really time for us to reinvent and reinvigorate what we know about health education uh, and uh, patient education. And we've known for years that there's a relationship between education and health, both direct um, and in, indirect. We know that edu it's education that you need if you want to improve uh, literacy, and we know that it's health education that we need if we want to improve health literacy. Um, in terms of those diagrams, many of you will be familiar with this one. This summarizes as neatly as any uh, what I think health literacy is about. It's a product of uh, what a person brings into the room um, in terms of their personal skills and abilities and what um, we, put into, we put into the room um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, how, how much we ask of people. Um, uh, what I've added to this, um, uh, rudely, I think, not disrespectfully, I hope, to Ruth Parker, who came up with the original model, is what do you need to do if you want to change things? And uh, I've identified three basic things that we need to do if we want to improve people's engagement with their health, we want to improve their understanding of their health, uh, and we want them to understand the social determinants of health so that they're supportive of the sorts of policy changes uh, that might bring about um, uh, uh, changes to the social determinants uh, we need, first and foremost an informed, confident, and engaged uh, group of citizens. Um, secondly, uh, we need to change the environment in which people um, engage with information about their health. Um, and we need far better communication than we currently have, both um, in method and particularly in content. Because if all the content is about personal behavior, as opposed to content about social determinants of health, people's responses will be bound up in personal behavior, not in understanding the wider determinants of health. The paper that I wrote, and I think was, I'm not sure if that's accurate, I think it was published in 2000. Uh, the paper that I wrote was eventually published, Health Literacy, a Public Health Goal, um, uh, the one that's now my most highly cited paper by a long way. Um, uh, tries to distinguish between different levels of health literacy, different types of health literacy. Functional health literacy, um, uh, where people are, are, are basically be able to perform functions related to their health. Interactive health literacy, where people can interact more successfully with available information. And critical health literacy, um, where we're engaging people in understanding the social determinants of health and engaging people more actively in trying to um, exert control over all of the factors that influence their health. Um, uh, and I'm not going to spend long on this because I think you're all very familiar with this. Um, the point is we can help people develop their health literacy skills. We can help them become more critical decision makers. We can help people to engage better in actions that tackle the social determinants of health. And what it depends on is exposure to different forms um, of information um, uh, helping people to respond confidently to information when they receive it um, uh, and using different communication methods. And there are many people I can see in the room who exemplify um, all of that. Um, as if you need reminding, it's a big problem. Um, we make assumptions um, that are false about people's knowledge and understanding um, of their health. Um, uh, we 
know, for example, uh, that around about 60% of Australians were classified uh, in the one survey that's been done to date um, as having inadequate health literacy. And by this, I mean um, what the ABS determined this to mean, that people who don't understand basic information about dose can't interpret successfully a nutrition label. 60% of the population, not a small um, uh, proportion affected by this. Health literacy matters. Um, I get back to the connection I keep making, um, uh, that uh, it's socially distributed like everything else. Um, uh, people with lower health literacy are found more um, frequently in those who are socially and economic to, uh, economically disadvantaged. People who we most want to respond effectively within the healthcare system are often those um, least able to do so. We can change things. Um, governments are finally taking it seriously. Uh, we do have a national statement on health literacy. We have a couple of our pillar organisations very involved um, uh, in um, the state min uh, the, 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 in the state uh, health. Um, CEC and ACI are both uh, very involved these days um, uh, in improving health literacy. <coughs> Excuse me, and we, and we know what to do. Um, what we have to do is to put into practice what we know we can do. And uh, I wanted to finish up um, just by mentioning some work that I'm now involved with. It's a, it, for me, it's a, uh, a sense of uh, uh, coming full circle. I'm now working very actively, more than I have for 35 years, um, with a local health district, uh, in this case, Western Sydney um, local health district, where we're setting up a health literacy hub. And uh, as I regularly tell the chief executive, all I'm trying to do is to get you to better spend the millions of dollars that you already spend on really rubbish communication um, within the healthcare system. Um, uh, the thousands of poorly written patient information pamphlets circulating in our healthcare systems. Um, the very poor quality interpersonal communication that's going on every day um, in our healthcare system. We already devote millions of dollars in resource every day, staff time, material resources, to very poor communication. We really ought to do better. Um, and I have to say he's been very persuaded and very supportive. Uh, so we're setting up a hub um, with a goal of building staff capacity, fostering innovation in our local health district, providing resources, um, and trying to create a much more health literate organisation um, in Western Sydney local health district. We've got some interesting ways of working that we're developing now. Um, uh, we're, develop we're hoping to launch in the next few weeks, um, a very interactive self-help web portal that gets, gives people much more immediate access to a range of resources and support tools to help them improve interpersonal communication um, and written communication. We are creating, we already have 400 people signed up to our community of practice. We have an active seminar series going on at the moment. And now we're getting staff seconded um, from different parts of the LHD to come and work as part of our hub. They don't give up their day job. They come and work with us for a day or two a week and then go back into uh, their day job as um, health literacy uh, ambassadors. We're making good use of the fact that there's this extraordinary investment going on in Western Sydney at the moment to more actively create health literate organisations in Westmead and Blacktown hospitals. Um, and we have a terrific program now um, growing by the day of innovative research and development with the University of Sydney um, Health Literacy Lab. We've identified um, a few immediate priorities. Um, you'll note some, some sort of uh, some things that uh, might be familiar from the things I've said before. Uh, we're particularly interested in transition through healthcare, uh, how people come into the health system and how they leave it. Um, and how well communication is done at those points of entry and exit. We're working very closely with uh, community health services on uh, supporting a healthy start to life. Uh, we're very focused um, on the prevention and management of chronic disease, working with the health promotion department and with uh, those working um, in the community with people with long-term and continuing illness. Uh, and as I've mentioned, we're trying to create health-promoting hospitals. 
So finishing up, how do you make sense of all of this? Well, um, just some personal reflections. Honestly, I feel, honestly feel like I've lived a charmed and privileged um, uh, existence, and, um, uh, and I hope I've given a sense that most of this has been an enjoyable journey uh, for me. Um, I cannot say enough how much um, my access to education um, has shaped all of my life chances and how committed I remain to ensuring that as many people as possible have, um, uh, uh, have the aspiration uh, and the access. And I've benefited personally throughout my career uh, from great uh, mentorship. On the professional reflections, well, I simply want to repeat the points I made earlier. It's tough. There isn't a single answer if we want to tackle um, uh, equity in health. I think the health promotion strategies we currently have really are the best answer. Uh, we have to get this balance right between uh, directly addressing the social determinants of health and bringing people with us um, uh, as we do so. Um, uh, and for me, it's the bringing the two together that uh, make healthy choices, easy choices. I shared with Mark the fact that I, I had gone through the family archives and, and found precisely 11 photographs of my entire childhood. Um, uh, and I had several of them in the presentation, um, and I removed them all um, because I was too embarrassed and self-conscious about it all. Um, uh, and he was actually a bit annoyed <laughs> when I told him this um, uh, uh, this morning. Um, uh, so I thought I'd finish uh, with a slide that, that is a from here to here um, slide, uh, uh, one photo from my childhood and one photo from um, quite near the end of my sort of formal career um, uh, in Australia, and it, it probably provides a, a oh, sorry, a quite neat summary. So I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I finished these slides late last night. I don't have a copy in front of me, so I don't know what's coming up. I meant to say, before I come on to that, that was a teaser, I meant to say before I come on to that, some of the themes that I've spoken about as a personal reflection are actually in this paper that was published a few months ago in the Health Education Journal. You may, if you hadn't fallen asleep since then, remember that in 1984, John Catford and I wrote this paper on what health promotion was. Um, uh, two years, bef well, with, uh, it was written in 1983, actually, published in 1984 in the Health Education Journal, uh, the longest continuous health education journal in the world, I'm told, celebrating um, its 75th anniversary, I think, this year, um, currently edited by Peter Aggleton of UNSW. Um, and Peter, last year, asked me if I would write a reflective piece um, for the journal, looking back on that paper and at how things had evolved um, over that piece. So if you're interested, um, there is this publication, um, Health Education and Health Promotion Revisited, reflecting on um, uh, something published uh, 35 years ago um, in the Health Education uh, Journal that you, you might want to have a look at for your amusement. So to the photo. So um, uh, although I told you of my impoverished existence, my sister emigrated to the US. And once a year at Christmas, we received a big parcel from the United States from my sister with presents. Um, for Christmas, and one Christmas, I got a cowboy outfit. <laughs> and uh, I gotta tell you, my mum tells me, I wouldn't take, I wore it every day for six months <laughs> um, before I would allow her to take it off and do something with it. Um, I was obsessed with being a cowboy uh, when I was a child. And the other one um, on the right, it's a very proud uh, day when I received an award on behalf of the University of Southampton for our um, excellence um, in higher education for the Queen and managed to get her to laugh at one of my jokes. <laughs> Look, she's laughing. Um, uh, take too long to explain the joke, but um, I did get the Queen to smile and she doesn't often smile. Um, uh, and um, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.